the revive. Guess what? This person comes alive, open his or her eyes, after a while, starts telling beautiful stories about what happened after their death. Really true. Many, many people have gone through this and many, many people have written books on it and leaving no doubt that they were, in some sense, really did have something. Should we call it experience? We can't, because the brain was dead. How can we call it experience if there was no consciousness there to collapse? Collapse produces experience. How, can they, how could they have experience? Quantum physics has answered to even that kind of question. It's called delayed choice. Consciousness collapsed upon revival of the brain. How do we prove that the consciousness is prior to the brain? We refer to these experiments now, which is commonplace. So many laboratories have done this, near death. People are revived and they report things that happened during the period in which their brain was dead. What does that mean? Consciousness is more than the brain. Believe it. Get it through your head, once and for all. Never think that you are in formation. Never think you are atoms and molecules, that's it. Quantum physics does not allow you to do that. Near-death experience data is showing you that, no, it could not be the brain that produced your consciousness. Get rid of such archaic scientific beliefs. These are false notions being propounded by scientists with vested interest and media, which is absolutely stupid and dumb, even in India, which is the country of the Upanishads. Why should we tolerate this? This is why I have started a movement called quantum activism. If you get the message here, propound it. Propagate it. Let other people know the good news. That no, we are not machines. We are human beings and we have the strangle hierarchy in the brain and the evidence of near death to prove it, that we are not just the brain. Our consciousness lives on when the brain was clearly dead. Okay, so we are, we are learning something. Third thing, what is the difficulty now for this separateness? What is the difficulty now that the separateness has a reason and the appearance of I has a reason? When I was not separate, I had causal power. I was Brahman. But now I am separate, the I that is separate not only it's separate from that tangled hierarchical quantum collapse, but we all know about conditioning. We are separate because of the samskaras conditioning that has taken place. Why conditioning? Because brain memorizes every event of collapse, every event of transformation of possibility into actuality, into brain circuits of memory, Every time a stimulus, the same stimulus is played again to the brain, brain not only plays back its response, but also the memory and its response to the memory. And that produces a prejudice in favor of past responses, conditioning. I see you, but I see you only the way that I saw you before. What a shame. I cannot see the new you. I only see the you I saw yesterday. These are the difficulties of the apparatus that we have, that we have to overcome, that prevents us, that prevents us from realizing that we are one, we have this causal power. So the challenge is, how do we get back? to this unity consciousness from which we have causal power. 
We call it downward causation. That's a phrase we have taken from Christianity, but that's okay. Christianity is also a great religion, just as Hinduism is, just as all religions are. They're all worshipping the same unity. They're all telling us how to go about finding this unity. And what do they say? They say all uniformly, all religions, pay attention not to the physical, but to the subtle world. Subtle energies. This conference has the name of energy medicine. The subtle energies are much more important to the body than the physical body. Physical body is crucial, of course. If the physical body dies, no representation, no separateness, we are only unity but no experience. Why separate bodies? Because even God wants experience, right? Divine Leela. So we are all performing our actions because God wants us to experience for the sake of the totality. Ultimately, it's true, like the Ikmanishad says, who is the real experiencer? Is that only? But it occurs to us. The universe is self-aware, but the self-awareness happens through us. So we are equally important, and our importance is revealed when we move towards that. In the warning we heard about, we have two kinds of desires, two kinds of intentions. Those speakers were so great. I loved the hour. One is towards life, one is towards death. In Freudian terminology, one is towards eros, God of the world, the worldliness, and the other is towards thanatos, liberation. And in the olden day, we thought that liberation is the object. Now we know better. This world has laws, scientific laws, order. Why should we call it trivia? I know what Shankaracharya says. I have read and read Shankaracharya to figure it out why the great Rishi called this world trivia. Then I concluded, okay, he didn't know any better. He did not know any better. No, no disrespect intended. I have highest respect for Shankara. He's one of the greatest masters. But the fact is they did not know about science. They did not know about the orderliness that exists in the world and that we can know the order. And by knowing the order, we can change the world from suffering into a joyful world. The ancient people wanted us to liberate because the world was suffering literally. We could not deal with the environment. Today we can. We could not heal our disease yesterday. Today we can. With integrative medicine we can. And this is the difference that we got to recognize. And therefore, as Indians, we must give up this enormous attraction that we feel towards getting out of the game, towards liberation. Give that up. Instead, concentrate on how to change the world. So how do we do it? We devise the way to get to the unity consciousness. Now, the previous speakers gave us the summary method, which, of course, spiritual traditions also give us, and that method is called meditation. Meditate and find out. This is good, but details are missing. If you want details, as Indians, you should all read Patanjali, Yoga Sutra, or you should read Buddha's Eightfold Way. Buddha doesn't say meditate, just meditate. Buddha gives eightfold way. Patanjali likewise gives eightfold way. And the center of this eightfold way are three processes. We have discovered this, we have made it into four, but that's a matter of further detail. But as Indians, you should be proud to know that Patanjali already had this 
creative process that we call it today. Patanjali already had discovered it. I don't know when Patanjali lived. People say it could be first century, it could be fourth century AD, or it could be before Christ was born. We don't know. But this Rishi, as he wrote in his great book, Yoga Sutra, he gave us the process. He gave us the process. And the process consists of, in Sanskrit, dharana, which translates as concentration, dhyana, bit confusing. Dhyana is not dharana, it's not concentration. But it's meditation, it's ideal. It's called awareness meditation, and just simply being mindful of what is going on. Dhyana. And then, third stretch, he calls it Somadhi. Somadhi. What does it mean? Well, remember the subject-object split arising from consciousness splitting whenever a collapse is occurring? Subject-object split. But then, conditioning, conditioning takes place, and the split becomes even bigger. And we, more and more, start thinking that we are superior to the objects that we see. Don't you feel superior to the objects? When I come into a picture, well, I'm a speaker, so you are all bowing to me and respecting me, but come on, if I came without this shirt, without this speaker tag, and without your knowing me, what would happen? Oh, there goes another hapless fellow. That's how we regard our environment. We don't care about who are we talking to. But look at Swamiji. He bows to everyone. That's the difference of enlightened people versus non-enlightened. Non-enlightened, let a passerby go. He is not important. He's not a speaker. He's just another fellow. That Swamiji, he can bow to everyone. He touched my feet. I was so touched. I, of course, I touched his feet too. I will touch his feet a thousand times because he's a great man. But the point is that he knows that I too have potential greatness. You too have potential greatness, that same oneness. And therefore, what's the difference? And that is the realization. So samadhi, when I don't look at you as inferior to me, object and subject have the same base or as close to each other as they can get. How does it happen? How do I get from this separate me, separate from you, not only separate from you, but superior from you. And look at how we create hierarchy. I'm sitting on a stage. I'm above you, right? So when we are in our ego, we are above our objects, hierarchical. I'm the top, you are the bottom. From that, we come down to recognizing that no objects and subjects are at the same level. Buddhism has a beautiful term for it, Patricha Samutpada. Dependent co-arising. Consciousness is splitting, but co-dependently. It's not subject creating the object, subject superior to the object, but object and subject are the same level. We call it a quantum leap in modern science. Patanjali called it samadhi. So what do we have? Dharana, dhyana, samadhi, fourth stage. Patanjali doesn't give it in the eightfold way, or stanga, but he puts it in the following chapter. Vibhuti Pada. Because he saw the manifestation of samadhi into acquiring various powers of manifesting. Today we generalize it, we say, we manifest generally what we discover. We get an insight through the quantum leap and we manifest that discovery. For example, I looked at you in relationship as inferior to me. In my experience of quantum leap, I realized that no, you and me are equal. There is no 
difference between your experience and my experience. Like you, I also experienced you as separate from me. But you experienced me as separate from you too. You are not important just because you are recognized by me as my relationship, but you are important because you are you. This is called discovering the otherness of the other. You really are a person, not a thing. Look how far you have come. Before, you were listening to scientists and you thought that everyone is just a thing, machine. And now, then you understood the basics of quantum physics, you thought you are consciousness, but then you were stymied with this idea that you are consciousness, but others are not. Others are just things. Because that separateness imposed upon you this idea that you are the center of the universe. How many of us go around the world thinking that, oh, pe people should pay attention to me? Why aren't they? And this pains us, this gives us unhappiness. But instead, when you have this Samadhi experience, you recognize that the other is a legitimate other, and so are you, a legitimate person. You become a person. And when you become a person, you know how to be a person in regular day-to-day -day life. How to be a person? Whenever we take a quantum leap. Whenever we see that insight, whenever we get that understanding. And in that moment, anything can happen. All these events of healing that we heard, that Dr. Newton and Lakshmiji described, that Paul Duan described beautifully. All these cases of healing, what are they? They are quantum leaps. In those moments, Healing can happen. Why? Because that moment is the moment of wholeness. Subject and object arising together from that wholeness. We never can experience the wholeness itself. But if we come that close, we see clearly that the insight that is coming is coming from the domain of potentiality itself.